Hello, BobTube. Um, it's been, I think, well, yeah, it's been exactly six days since my surgery. I'm still very much in dressing gown phase. <laughs> it's actually right here. <laughs> So I just thought I'll take it off because it's signal red and maybe looks a bit weird. But anyway, yeah, I'm feeling slightly better today. Well, at least this afternoon. So I thought um, I might try and film a video. I wanted to film one about what I've recently been reading, but I felt like I need to gather my thoughts a bit more on this one um, before I do that. Um, however, I have seen this really fun looking challenge on um, Scott and Nell's channel, Gunpowder Fiction and Plot, um, which I think they replicated it from uh, Book Break, uh, Emma from Book Break. And I think she got it from elsewhere. Wait, I've looked it up and I've forgotten the name again. I think it originated from Books Under Covers, which is a channel that hasn't posted in a year or so. So um, anyway, it's a challenge of 25 books in two minutes, um, where basically you get given five fresh prompts and you're supposed to uh, try and rattle off answers for those prompts um, within two minutes. I'm pretty sure that I will fail miserably because I'm absolutely terrible at memorizing these things or, you know, at thinking on the spot, but I thought I'm going to give it a try anyway. And um, yeah, Scott, Scott and Nell were very nice and uh, immediately provided some prompts. Um, I also have no way of putting it, setting a timer. I think we'll just see what happens whilst I'm recording this. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, I forgot to mention from those 25 books then, if you may manage to say 25 anyway, you're supposed to pick five and then review them. Again, this review will probably be very bad, but I'm gonna try. Okay, so here we go. Prompt number one, five books titled The, oh, that was nice. Okay, um, The Crimson Petal and the White, The New York Trilogy, uh, The Binding, um, this should be easier than what I'm doing right now, right? The binding, the... Hello? I'm blanking! Oh, the unfortunates, because I'm just seeing it there. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Sorry. The unfortunates and what's the VIP? Oh, come on, Zina. The illumination of Ursula Flight. There we go. I did not actually look there. But yeah, anyway. Terrible. Uh, five books by authors who write multiple genres. Ooh, difficult. Kate Atkinson writes it different. Yeah, she writes the Jackson Brody crime series. So she's got what? What's one of them? Uh, got up, got up early, took the dog, or something like that. Was one of them, I think. And then she also wrote in a historical fiction, which would be uh, Life After Life. And she also wrote a spy thriller of sorts which was transcription, that's number three. And now I don't know where else to go. And this is my cat moving the camera. Uh, Terry Pratchett, The Long Earth versus Terry Pratchett, anything else from the Discworld, uh, making money. Um, Five books set close to where you live. I'm probably going to fail on this one. I know barely any. I'm presuming Hermann Hesse wrote somewhere, set around somewhere here. So I'm going to say Glass Beat Game, in a, the broader area at least. And then I have one that's called Wolf, which is set in the Black Forest, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't read that yet. Um, and I don't know any other ones, so I'm just going to skip. Um, five books with less than 200 pages. Franz Kafka Metamorphosis, Stefan Zweig Chess Novella, uh, All Systems Red, I assume, by Martha Wells, uh, Kim Jong, born 1984 or two, and the fifth, Royal Marsh uh, Daylight. That's a poetry collection. Is that cheating? I don't know. I'm just gonna, oh, if, if it is cheating, I'm going to say. Ghost War by Sarah Moss. Okay, and five books with siblings as major characters. Invisible by Paul Auster. Speaking of incest, um, The Innocents. 
Um, oh, I've forgotten his name. But anyway, I'm going to look it up. The Innocence. Um, little Women. Uh, siblings, siblings as major characters. I'm blanking. I'm sure I've read other ones with siblings. Oh, for <clears throat> can I look? I don't think it'll help anyway. <laughs> um, have I read anything in recent? Oh, wait, the Dutch house. That's important sibling relationship. Uh, I don't know. Can you see that cat being annoying? I think he's going to turn over the bin. Yeah, he's going to turn it over, isn't he? Great. Are you having fun? Okay. Um, I've probably failed. Yeah, I've definitely failed. Um, I don't, I can't think of any other sibling characters, which is ridiculous. Um, and I've already failed on the people, uh, the place one. Anyway, I'm going to stop it and I'm going to think about what I've just done and try and review the books that, uh, you know, pick a few that I've actually read um, that I can review in, in this thing here. So, hello again. Um, as you can probably tell, it is quite a bit later. Um, I had a little bit of a... Uh, interruption with pain. Um, anyway, so I have uh, tried to come back and pick five books um, and I must say that I really don't know what on earth I was doing to myself trying to sort of come up with these random, um, what do you say, book titles. Half of them, Some of them I haven't even read, it was just a uh, titles that were on my mind, so I can't review them, and others I've read so long ago that I feel like I'm not really confident in knowing how to describe them. But um, in the spirit of this being very, supposed to be, supposed to be a quick video, right? <laughs> or, um, well, also because I'm not too well, I don't want to spend too much time. Um, so let's just, you know, preface this with just as I failed naming 25 books in two minutes, I shall also be failing at doing actual real reviews. And this is just going to be a sort of very, very quick, a hot take on whatever I can remember, okay? So, um, that being said, let's start with the one that is, has been, that I've not read in for the longest time, right? So, like, can I even speak today? Okay, let's start with the one that I have forgotten most the most about, probably. Uh, that would be Hermann Hesse's Glass Speed Game. Um, sorry, this is a bit, um, it's one of those plasticky covers, so it's shiny. Um, yeah, the Glass Speed Game. I actually really like this word. <laughs> and it's, it is the one that I bought back then when I was reading it. So, um, Glass Speed Game is Hermann Hesse's last novel, or the last full-length novel. I should say. Um, and I think I was rough, I think I was 19 when I read it. Um, it was just after graduating from school and I was in Taiwan. I have very vivid memories of reading it there, which is such an odd choice to be reading in the middle of summer when you're in Taiwan. But anyway, um, I loved it. But I think most of it went over my head, probably. It's an incredibly cerebral book or um, intellectual or whatever, which I probably deemed myself to be one, you know, as a 19-year-old. Um, and it's playing in this sort of... Um, can you say alternate reality or possibly... Future, I'm not sure. I think I would say alternate reality or something. Um, where there is this thing called the glass bead game, this glass pan spiel. And it is some, somewhat of a, well, it's, it sounds like a very abstract concept. And I think the way it's described here, it also seems like the game itself is rather abstract. But it is, it seems like it's um, 
sort of the conglomeration of um, humanity's um, striving for knowledge and creative um, endeavors as well. So you have, you know, you have like math and sciences, but then also, yeah, you know, the arts. And it seems like all of that is interwoven in this glass bead game, um, which some people have dedicated their life to learning and perfecting. Um, it's and it follows one person who I can't even remember his name is. Is it Magister Ludi? Oh yeah, Magister Ludi is his um is his title, I think, that he gets at some point after studying this game in this sort of almost monastery-like institution. Um, but his name is Josef Knecht. There we go. Um, so it follows him. Um, and I can't say any more than that, apart from, yeah, let's just stress again that I, probably most of it went over my head. I think I read it again in my early 20s and probably still missed notes and now um, I feel like maybe I should be reading it again as you know like 15 years later that would be good anyway um last words for this if you've never read Hesse I would not start with this I think it might put you off him even though I think it's beautiful but I think it's yeah it's so abstract I, I don't think it would be a good start Start with something different. Um, okay, the next one um, is also, I don't know if I have, have very clever things to say about this, but um, I managed this one, right? The Unfortunates. I think I've also managed mentioned it before. Um, B.S. Johnson, The Unfortunates. This is that great little thing where um, the book is actually not a book. It's a little box. And you get the chapters wrapped up like so. And obviously you can remove this and then what, so basically what you're supposed to do is you have, you have a beginning, like the first chapter and you have an end chapter and those ones are fixed and all the other ones you can take out and you can shuffle them around and read them in whatever order that, you know, they land in. So it's clearly rather experimental. Um, this has not been touched because I have not read, I have read, I have read it, but I've read it for a class where we got these um, scans of the, of the chapters. And I remember hearing about that first, so I printed them all out and then did the exact same thing. I took all the ones that were not the beginning and the end chapters, mixed them all up and read them. Um, and then at some point I wanted to buy my own. Um, to be perfectly honest, I feel like I may not have read the whole thing. <laughs> I think we got quite a lot of scans, but this looks like it may be more than what I read. So um, there you go. That's ridiculous, isn't it? So how do you, how are you reviewing a book that you haven't read or that you're not sure you've read 100%? But anyway, um, so I feel like it's actually relatively <laughs> unimportant what it's about, but let's just go. Okay, so it's about this sports journalist who is being sent to a town um, where uh, he's supposed to cover a football game. Um, and as he goes there, he, he thought before that, I think, he thought that he'd never been there. But when he goes there, all of a sudden his memory is jogged um, and he realizes that he's actually been there and not just been there once or twice, that one of his best friends used to live there. And somehow he forgot, I don't know how he's forgotten. Is, have I forgot? No. Well, whatever. So, so definitely, yeah, one of his best friends. And this best friend has died in the past, like, you know, before this story takes place. He had cancer. Um, and so... Basically, he, he keeps getting these memories of, you know, wh when he was with him, his friend also helped him with some manuscripts, I think, because he had, um, in, so the, the, the journalist has uh, ambitions to be a writer uh, beyond journalism. Um, and yeah, all these things sort of come streaming in 
for him. And um, I think part of that sort of experiment of having the, all these chapters mixed up uh, is, is trying to sort of replicate how human memory is not chronological and it's, it's rather chaotic. Um, so that I found quite interesting and intriguing or whatever um, and I thought it worked quite well. There were a few bits where I thought okay maybe this is now a little bit weird if for example you ended up like having as one of the first chapters him being at the football game and then later going to a pub and eating in preparation for that I don't know if that would work so well because you know he doesn't just describe memories he also describes his day and what's going on during the day so I don't know if that would work so well I guess it didn't happen for me when I read it so I can't I can't I guess I can't comment on that but um yeah I don't know I just I just love that sort of idea and this sort of experiment um there you go but if you want to read something a bit more if you want to try it out B.S. Johnson and you want to read something that is more conventional, I would go with Christy Murray's own double entry that has only, you know, a few sort of postmodern um, elements to it, but it's relatively conventional to read. Um, okay, what else do we have? Um, we have Terry Pratchett's Making Money. So I think I've mentioned this book as well before why is I mean I've not even made 10 videos and I keep repeating myself but anyway it was the first one I could think of um part of that is because like I said Moist von Lipwick who is the pr protagonist here is one of my favorite characters in the disc world um besides a lot of lots of other ones of course because they're all brilliant um slight interruption again okay so Moist von Lipwick in Making Money um, like I said, this is the second book with him. Did I say that? I don't know. I have said it at some point. So it's the second book with him. Um, in the first one, we meet him where he's supposed to basically revamp the post office because it has not been working very well or at all, to be honest. And he used to be a con man, right? And he's been put in charge of this because somehow the... Um, dictator in the city of Ankh-Morpork thinks that he's the right man for the job. And um, in making money, as the title suggests, he is put in charge of the mint um, because apparently that is has been running um, at a loss. Um, and what I like about this is basically, um, it's one of the things that Terry Pratchett does so well. He um, puts this sort of, you know, he describes the development of some sort of technology that we may sort of be familiar with, you know, that we have in the real world um, technology or concept like money. Um, and he puts it into Discworld uh, terms and translates it in a way that makes it quite, that it, A, sort of is a satirical take on our world, but also is quite funny and inventive, you know, the ways in which it differs from what we know here. Um, and I think that's really, really well done in here. And um, well, apart from that, there's obviously a lot of other fun stuff that I can't remember because it's been I don't know, 15 years? I don't know, when was this actually published? Okay, it can't have been 15. Ah. Well, anyway, it's been over 10 years since I've read it. So um, there we go. But um, I do think, I think somebody else told me that they started reading Discworld with the first Moist Van Lipwick novel, the Going Postal one. Um, and I think that's actually a really good way of doing it. I mean, there's obviously other ways of starting it, either the chron chronological way or in different other series or standalone books. But I think um, whoever recommended that to my friend uh, did a good job. I think that's a really good one to start with if you're interested in the disc world. So that's... But actually, I read this one first because I was given this as a present and I didn't realize that 
was the second and it doesn't really matter but I would recommend starting with the first so that would be going postal anyway that's that and then lastly no that's only that's the fourth isn't it um I cannot actually yet review the whole collection because I haven't read the whole thing yet so here's my next fail but so far this is absolutely fantastic and um, this is a poetry collection that I heard of at Mark Nash's channel who did a lovely review of it um, so this is contemporary poetry I think it was published was it this year no no it's last year I think 2020 because I thought I thought for a moment that we were in 2020. No, yeah. So it was published in 2020, so it's quite new. Um, it's I don't read enough poetry, so I, I also lack the skill of discussing it. I can just tell you that I think this is absolutely fantastic. When I got it, or when I got home and it was there for waiting for me, I had to pick it up immediately and start reading, and then I sort of compulsively <laughs> read one after the other. Obviously, at some point I stopped, don't you really like reading a whole poetry collection in one go? I think that's, I don't know. It's sometimes I, I, I don't, I need time to digest. Um, but I think it's, um, it's beautifully done. She's, you know, she has something to say, but not only does she has, have something to say, she also does it beautifully. Um, and skillfully. Um, there's some brilliant wordplay in here um, that I love anyway, but I love it even more if it's not just done to show off, if you know what I mean, if it's, if it's done to actually um, enhance whatever it is that you're trying to say in your piece of art, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, I think she does that really tremendously well, in my opinion. And um, I, I photographed one of the um, poems and sent it to my friend. And he said, ah, that reminds me a lot of spoken word artists. And then obviously I had to look it up. And yes, that's actually what she is as well. Um, she's a spoken word uh, poet, spoken word artist. Is how did you say that that way? Anyway, you know, the whole thing that came from poetry slams and stuff like that. And I love that sort of thing. I mean, they can be terrible, but there's also some amazing stuff that comes out of poetry slams and that sort of thing. Um, and I think this is one of the best examples. Like, you know, one of the best that that sort of thing has to offer, in my opinion. So, take it or leave it. <laughs>